Hey, what's up, my New Calvary family? This is Pastor Small reaching out to you. We hope that you are enjoying our Summer Madness Throwback Series in this month of August. We hope you're being blessed by these outstanding preachers that have blessed the New Calvary Baptist Church in our revival season. This time, we know that you remember this one. This is my sister, my big sister, uh, from another mister, holding it down, OMG, the Reverend Dr. Gina M. Stewart, pastor of Christ Missionary Baptist Church. She's got an outstanding word for us tonight, so we hope that it blesses your spirit. We want you to hear it. We want you to take it in. We continue to pray for you and hope things are going well. So y'all take care. We'll see you soon. Peace. day that the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. We bless and thank our God tonight for this privilege to be in worship, for this opportunity to be refreshed, for the times of refreshing in the presence of our God. For certainly we're living in times where we need revival. And I'm so glad that God had in mind, put it on this pastor's heart that he would call this meeting tonight. Can you thank God that you press your way tonight? Can you thank God that you are yet alive and that everything that the enemy tried to do to you did not work in spite of him shooting his best shot? Can you clap your hands and give God praise for the victory that is already yours in Christ Jesus? Would you reach out and touch somebody's hand now as we go God, we are so grateful tonight. We do bless your name. Because your name is the name that is above every name. And your name is worthy to be praised. Your name is a strong tower. The righteous can run to you and find safety. And so we say thank you tonight for the power that's in your name. We say thank you for the power that's in the name of Jesus that demons tremble at the sound of that name. And now we speak your name. We speak your name because we know there's power in your name, there's healing in your name, there's deliverance in your name. Yes, it is. We thank you that, that we know the name of Jesus. It's the name of Jesus that saved some of us. And we give you praise tonight. We say thank you for revival. We say thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence. We say thank you for the hand that we hold. We thank you that they are proof that the God we serve is still a God who works everything out for our good. You, they are proof that what the weapon that was formed against us, even though it was formed, it did not prosper. We thank you for the neighbor who stands beside us tonight. We don't know what they need, but God, we believe by faith that you have a word for us. We celebrate the relevance of this word because we believe that you're intimately acquainted with every detail of our life. But God, just in case this word is not relevant for my neighbor, I pray that they'll store it because the day's going to come that they might need it. Now save somebody tonight. Show yourself mighty and strong. Throw your weight around. Change our thinking so that we can change how we live. Melt the dross. Satisfy our hunger. Touch us where we need to be touched. God, we thank you in advance because we believe you hear us when we pray. And because you watch over your word to perform it. We put our hands together now and we give you our best praise. Somebody thank the Lord. In Jesus' name, come on, clap those hands. Hallelujah. And it is so. Amen. Amen. Before you take your seat, before you take your seat, would you help me thank God for your pastor, for my brother, for your leader, for the comedian. If he ever wants another job, he can do comedy. We praise God for the Reverend Dr. Marcus Small. We have become brothers and sisters, and I am grateful uh, for his friendship and uh, for who he is to the kingdom and who he is to Norfolk, Virginia, for who he is to the Proctor Conference. 
we always end up sitting beside each other because of our last name, so I know he's a cut up, amen. But I'm not telling you all anything that you don't know, right? But we are grateful uh, for him and for his ministry, for his love for you and for his love for the Lord, for his love for his family. We congratulate him on his new publication. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. Give God praise for him tonight, for this magnificent music ministry that have blessed us. Oh, they're out in the audience now. Come on, put your hands together and give God praise for the music ministry. The Reverend Evelyn Scott for your hospitality. Reverend Byron, God bless you. It's always good to see you. My classmate, Reverend Dr. Nicole McDonald, who always helps me out in class. Amen. She helps me out. She keeps me on track. We are grateful for her brilliance and for her genius and her intellect. And certainly we give God praise for all of these preachers, clergy brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters in Christ and creation. It's good to be here. Now, there is a word from the Lord tonight in Romans chapter 8, verse 24 through 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 24 through 28. And I'll be reading from the New International Version of Scripture. When you find it, would you stand with me if you're not already standing uh, and say amen. Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 24 through 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 24 through 28. When you find it, say amen. And I believe it's on the screens. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of them who love him and for those who are the called according to his purpose. I want to put a tag on verse 24 for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. This is the word of the Lord. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord shall stand forever. As you take your seat, shout my title to your neighbor. Tell him, don't let life steal your hope. I want to talk tonight from the subject, don't let life steal your hope. A couple of weeks ago, two icons, Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain, took their lives by suicide. Their stories dominated the news most of the week. And their death and the subject of depression, I'm sure because of their celebrity status, dominated many media outlets, Twitter feeds, as well as Facebook status updates. But before Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain took their life, there was a young woman in my church, 14 years old, a student at Riverview School and a young medical doctor Julian Matthew Richardson, who committed suicide just two months prior to his graduation this past May. They are not the only ones, persons on public stages, people in unknown places, and even in the Bible, have made the same choice for various reasons. Billie Holiday, Donny Hathaway, Robin Williams, who made all of us laugh and yet ended his own life. Don Cornelius, Marilyn Monroe, Jovan Belcher, Phyllis Hyman, Chris Benoit, Ernest Hemingway, Vince Van Gogh, Virginia Woolf, Freddie E., Alexander McQueen, Les 
Thompson are just some of the names of familiar or famous people who have ended their own lives. And not just in history and culture, but if you check the scripture, you will also find that in the Bible there were people who ended their own lives. Zimri, who briefly reigned over Israel, died in a house fire he started himself. He knew that he was about to be overthrown by his enemies, and so he could not bear defeat, and he ended his own life. King Saul, the first king of Israel, fell on his own sword after losing a battle against the Philistines. Samson, who was known for his strength and who allowed Delilah to trick him into telling him the source of his strength, stopped allowing God to direct his life, failed to sin, forfeited his unbelievable strength, and was subjected to humiliation at the hands of the Philistines. Faced with ridicule and failure, Samson, in a final act of strength, pulled the pillars down, killing himself and his captors. And finally, we also know that Judas, one of the 12, one who was in the inner circle of Jesus Christ, ended his own life by hanging himself after betraying Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And when Saul's armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, the Bible tells us that he likewise fell upon his own sword and died. And perhaps you've heard of Ahithophel, Bathsheba's granddad. The Bible says that because his advice was not followed when he was attempting to overthrow David from the throne with Absalom, he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his own town, and he put his house in order, and he hanged himself. And so he died and was buried in his father's tomb. And then what we learn from the recent deaths of Kate Spade, Anthony Bourdain, and others is that life is difficult. Life is not just difficult. Can you tell somebody life show is hard? Life is difficult and life is hard because we live in a broken world. A world over which Brueggemann says that God presides. A world that Brueggemann says is often pictured as sacred canopy. A world over which God presides, but a world that is broken by sin and pain and war and terminal disease and poverty and hunger and corporate greed and unemployment, and gluttony, and mental illness, and sex and human trafficking, and children being left at the borders, and mass shootings, and terrorist attacks, and sex slavery, and racism, and world hunger, and racial profiling, and unemployment, and poverty, and violence, and mass shootings, and killings, and police brutality, and disease, and suffering, and greed, and financial difficulties, all of these are reminders that life is hard. Oh, you at church tonight, but if we tell the truth, we have to admit that life is hard. Some of us have the testimony of Natalie Cole catching hell, because life is difficult. Life is hard. Oh, yeah, we're smiling and we are lifting up holy hands, but if we really tell the truth, if you get behind the facade and uh, Smokey Robinson call it the tears of a clown, if you get past the smiles that are on our face, some of us are really struggling because the truth of the matter is saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, do speak in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance, but life can still be hard. Life can be hard, life can be difficult, life can be painful because life brings pain. Life can be painful because of physical pain. Pain has been described as physical suffering or distress due to illness or injury, bodily disorder or disease. Someone here is living with physical pain. Physical pain from an accident, an injury, or even sickness or disease. You want to stand up, but you can't stand up. 
You want to lift your hands, but you can't lift your hands because you are living with physical pain. Your body is telling you one thing and your mind, come on here, is saying something else. Somebody knows about physical pain. But not only is there physical pain in the house, there is emotional pain. Pain that is internal. It is the pain that arises out of the invisible wounds that happen to us from living this life. When our hearts are broken by abandonment, our feelings that we are, the feelings that we are unloved, the emotional pain of rejection, the pain of the loss of a loved one, a friend, a relationship, loss due to grief or dream or depression, because we are hurting and emotional pain can be even worse than physical pain. Because at least with emotional pain, I mean with physical pain, I can get a Band-Aid. With physical pain, somebody can give me a prescription. Come on here. With physical pain, I can take a pill or take a Tylenol and end it up. But emotional pain sometimes can be so devastating because there's no pain like the pain of rejection. There's no pain like the pain of bullying and abandonment and mental anguish and a broken heart. And the truth is, you can take a pill for emotional pain, but sometimes it seems that the pain just won't go away. Sometimes it seems, God help me preach tonight, that the cloud just won't move, that the cloud just won't lift, that the sun is never going to shine again. Somebody knows what it's like to experience emotional pain. Emotional pain is sometimes worse than physical pain because you cannot always tell when a person is hurting. And although the suicides of Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain have generated a great deal of discussion around depression as the cause of suicide, the truth is that we see from biblical examples that there are many reasons why people end their lives. There are many reasons why people end their lives as there are people in this room. The young lady, the 14-year-old, who was a member of my church, ended her life because of bullying. Bullying not just because of her classmates, but allegedly because of bullying by an administration. Judas ended his life because of remorse and regret. And Bimelech ended his life, Ahimsophel ended his life, I'm sorry, because of bitterness. Matthew Warren, the son of Rick Warren and Julian Richardson, the young medical doctor who was to graduate from UT Medical School this May, ended their lives because of their battles with depression. And there are probably a multitude of other causes, hopelessness, loneliness, and even self-will that leads a person to cross the line and never come back. I shall never forget the year that one of our photographers in our church went home and blew his brains out. He was at service that Sunday morning in the balcony taking pictures, but by that Saturday, he had taken a gun and, and taken and ended his own life with a self-inflicted wound to his head. And when his son showed up, he said, I just wish my daddy had not given up. Because the truth of the matter is there are a whole lot of reasons that can make a person want to take their life. And if we tell the truth, some of us in this room have said to ourselves, even though we didn't really mean it, that there were times we wished that God would come and get us. If you don't think it's true, just look at Elijah, who sat under a broom tree after he had had a major victory and killed 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And Jezebel found out what he had done and said she was coming after him. And he ran and sat under a broom tree and said, take my life because I'm no better than my father's because life is hard. Can I get a witness? Life is painful. Life can be difficult and you cannot always solve it by jumping up, spinning around three times and throwing money on the altar. Sometimes life is rough. The tragedy of ending one's life deepens because sometimes it involves misdirected hope. A teenager overdoses because a boyfriend ends their relationship. A senior citizen ends it all after hearing the news of cancer. A prominent businessman goes bankrupt and shoots himself. A person who has gambled away all of his or her money jumps off a building in Las Vegas because they don't see any hope left. 
When losses seem irre irretrievable or irrecoverable or irredeemable and there seems to be no exit, that's the problem. When there seems to be no exit to the pain, when it looks like it's never going to get any better, even though ending one's life is a, is a permanent solution to a temporary situation, many people suffer from a loss of hope or misdirected hope, both of which breed hopelessness. Perhaps this is why Paul tells us in tonight's text, we are saved by hope. Hope is an expectation or belief in the fulfillment of something desired. Hope is the existential, Reverend Nicole, direction of one's whole self toward an expected or promised future. Hope is the expectation of a favorable future under God's direction. Hope is different from optimism. Yes, people with faith do live with an optimism bias, but optimism is the view that everything is going to work out fine because it has to, but the truth of the matter is that ain't always true. If we look at what's going on in the news today with children being separated from their parents and a president in the White House that acts like a preschooler who refuses to do something about these children separated from their parents and lying like he can't do anything because the real smoke screen is that he's really trying to get us to build a wall and using children as a bargaining chip, it doesn't necessarily mean that things always work out because they have to. Slavery is proof that things don't always work out because they have to. Black and brown bodies dying in the street are proof that things don't always work out because they have to. So hope is more than optimism. Hope is knowing that it's the confidence that there is ultimate meaning in the midst of my loss and that somehow in the midst of all the madness, everything is going to work out for the good in the fullness of time. We can live without optimism, but we cannot make it without hope. Biblical hope is based on the faithfulness and the integrity of God. Can I give you a news flash and tell you that folk are fickle, but God is faithful. And because God is faithful, you have hope. You can have hope and a future. Circumstances cannot be trusted, but God can be trusted. Hope is what rescues us from despair. Hope is what keeps us from lowering our expectations. Hope is what gets us through hard times. Hope is what gets us through bailouts and layoffs and divorce and disappointment and financial meltdowns and mortgage meltdowns. Hope is what sustains people in third world countries who don't have basic water, who don't have the basic necessities of life, but they can sing praises to God for an hour and 30 minutes because they are saved by hope. And Paul says we are saved by hope. Hope is what sustains people living in third world countries in South Africa, living with the residue of a legacy of apartheid. Yeah, yeah, Poverty yeah. and oppression and disease and depravity, but they still have a God that doesn't have to perform. They love a God so much that they can worship him day in and day out and walk to church in the rain, sometimes with no visible evidence of change because hope is what helps to keep us alive. And Paul said we are saved by hope. And as our text tonight indicates, Paul understood the necessity of hope. Notice what he says. He says, for we are saved. We are rescued by hope. For hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what does he have to hope for? Paul was acquainted with pain. In fact, Paul was not a stranger to pain himself. In his letters, he does not mince words about his struggles. One of the reasons why I love the Bible so much, one of the reasons why the Bible is such a source of inspiration for my life is because we find that they don't mince words, they don't sugarcoat experiences. They don't hide reality from us. In fact, if you read the Psalter, you'll find that over one-third of the Psalter, as Walter Brueggemann says, is made up of psalms of disorientation. Psalms that acknowledge that life ain't fair, even though God is good. Psalms that acknowledge that life is not always experienced as sacred canopy, even though God is presiding over the world. I like the Bible because the Bible gives us stories of real life folk who had struggles just like us. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. And the Bible tells us that for three times he sought the Lord, that the Lord might remove the thorn, that it might be taken away from him because it was limiting his range of motion. Somebody knows 
about the pain that limits your range of motion. Some of you tonight are saying like Paul, if I could just get rid of this, if this could just let me go, if I could just shake this, I could be better, I could serve better, I could love better, I might even have a better attitude. But sometimes, how do you know that God doesn't move the thorn, but God gives you the grace to handle the thorn in the midst of the... I wish I had somebody that could just tell somebody his grace is sufficient. And his power is perfected in your weakness. Paul said, therefore, I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ might rest upon me. For when I'm weak, then am I strong. Paul knew what it was to live with pain. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 through 11, he talks about the hardships that he suffered in the province of Asia. He said, we were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure, so we despaired for our life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, he says, five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city. It's in your Bible. In danger in the country, in danger in sea, in danger from false brethren. I've labored and toiled and have gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and I've been naked. And besides everything, I face the daily pressures of my concern for all the church. Paul knew what it was to live with pain. He understood the need for hope because he wasn't just acquainted with pain, but he was acquainted with the realities of living in an imperfect world and the pressures of ministry. Can I tell you that pain and pressure will steal your hope? Can I tell you that the reality of living in an imperfect world will steal your hope? The pressure of life will steal your hope. The pressures of looking at the news every day is enough to give you PST, even if you haven't been to the military. Because there's always something that gets your pressure up. Resistance is draining. Resistance is draining. Resistance wears you down. Hope is critical in this existential reality because we live in, a, uh, in an imperfect world where there's a gap between what is and what ought to be. There's a gap between what God prefers and what is actually taking place. It was because of the gap between what is and what ought to be that Martin Luther King went to Montgomery, Alabama. I can't get no help in here. It was because of the gap between what is and what ought to be that Rosa Parks said, ain't giving up my seat. It was because of the gap between what is and what ought to be that people marched across Selma Bridge. We live in an imperfect world. And because we live in an imperfect world, because we live with pressure, it will steal our hope. Bullying stole Alexica's hope. Depression stole Kate Spade's hope. Anthony Bourdain's hope and, and Julian Richardson's hope. But I've come to tell you tonight that life doesn't have to steal your hope. Because if hope does anything for us, it ought to alter your perspective. I wish I had some help in here. Look at somebody say, hope will change my perspective. You see, it was perspective that called the 10 spies to see the giants while Caleb and Joshua saw the Lord. It was perspective that caused David to believe that he could whoop Goliath. Even though he didn't have any experience, he was toting cheese. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Coming to see his brothers while they were out there being bullied by Goliath. It was perspective that prompted Rahab to believe that she and her family could be saved in spite of the fact that the walls of Jericho were going to come tumbling down. And I got a sneaky suspicion that there are some people in here tonight that you survived because of your perspective. It's not because you don't have problems. It's not because you haven't had an opportunity to try to slit your wrist or jump off a bridge, but it's because you had perspective. You had perspective that reminded us that Jesus could still handle your pressure. Don't you hear him say, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy, 
and my burden is light. Can you just preach to somebody and say, I'm glad his yoke is easy. And I'm glad that his burden is light. Can you just encourage somebody tonight and tell them, I'm so glad that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. You in pain tonight? His yoke is easy. You frustrated tonight? His yoke is easy. You overwhelmed tonight? His yoke is easy. You burdened tonight? His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Now I don't know who I'm talking to tonight. I'm certainly not trying to over trivialize or over spiritualize the reality of our struggle. But I just stopped by to tell somebody that don't let light steal your hope. All your darkest hour is just before day. Weeping may endure for a night. God, I feel my help now. But joy will come in the morning. Can you tell somebody don't let life steal your hope? Don't let life destroy your faith. David said I would have fainted unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I wish I had a few people in here that could just look back over your shoulder and think about how you almost gave up. Asaph said, I was just about to quit. I was about to go over the edge. My foot had almost slipped, but then I went to church. Somebody ought to give him praise that you came to church. Why don't you open your mouth and give God praise that you kept coming to church? Can you shake somebody's hand and tell them I'm glad I came to church? I'm glad I came to worship. I'm glad I kept on coming. I'm glad I kept on praising. I'm glad I kept on serving because I almost let go. I almost went over the edge. But then I came into the sanctuary and I understood that trouble don't last always. I wish I had a few people that have been through a few things, who have been through the fire and have been through the flood, but you're still here. You are still standing. You still got a praise. You still have your testimony. You still got joy. And this joy that you have, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. Why don't you clap your hands and give God some praise that life didn't steal my hope. Look at somebody said life didn't steal my hope. Look at somebody said don't let life steal your hope. I just came by tonight to tell somebody that I know it's hard. I know it's frustrating. I know it's painful. I know life is difficult, but God is still who God says God is. God is still sitting on the throne. He does not come up for re-election. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. He cannot be impeached. He cannot be re-elected. He is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above everything that you ask or think according to the power that works in us. You ought to give him praise tonight that you don't have to let life steal your hope. Look at somebody and say, don't let life steal it. Tell somebody, don't let life steal your hope. Tell somebody, don't let life steal your hope. There is a tomorrow after this. And what I'm trying to tell somebody tonight is that at the heart of the Christian hope is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The significance of the resurrection is that he points to Jesus' victory over death. But not only does it point to his victory over death, it also extends the victory to those of us that belong to him. Can you preach to somebody and tell them I'm not fighting for victory, I'm fighting from victory because I already got the victory because Jesus has already given me the victory. When he got up from the grave and he took the sting out of death and he ascended back to heaven and he sent the power of the Holy Ghost so I could have the power to be a witness Dr. Jeremiah Ray would put it this way. He says it's when the vertical dimension balances out the horizontal dimension. He says it might not settle everything because the truth of the matter is sometimes we need prayer. Sometimes we need a prescription. Y'all ain't saying nothing. 
Sometimes we need counseling. Sometimes we need a prescription. We need counseling and we need prayer. And then sometimes we just need somebody to talk us off the ledge. That's what I came for tonight. I just came to talk somebody off the ledge. tonight to say to somebody who's sitting here with a smile on your face that it will get better. That God can hear you everywhere you hurt. That life can be hard, but Jesus can handle the pressure. Can you just hug somebody and tell them Jesus can handle the pressure? Can you just minister to somebody and tell them Jesus can handle the pressure? I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but somebody ought to encourage somebody tonight and tell them Jesus can handle your pressure. Come on, don't look at me funny. Come on, this is revival. Look at somebody say, Jesus can handle the pressure. Whatever you're going through, whatever your heart is broken, wherever it's causing you to cry in the dark, whatever it's causing you to shed tears, Jesus. I wish I had a few worshipers now. Can handle your pressure. I wish I had a few people that could just lift your hands and meet me up here at this altar. And begin to just receive what God has for you. This is not a quick fix. I'm not, in, I'm not standing here to intend to tell you that this is going to be a, a, an end all or a cure all. But I'm here tonight to talk somebody off the ledge. I'm here tonight to talk about the elephant in the room. I'm here tonight to say that in the midst of the shouting. And in the midst of the praise and in the midst of lifting up holy hands and nobody likes to praise God like I pray, like I like to praise God. Nobody likes to give God glory like I give God glory. But sometimes we come crying and we go home crying. We come in pain and we go home in pain. But tonight I came to talk somebody off the edge. I came tonight to tell somebody what Paul Morton said to the people in New Orleans when he met some of his church members for the first time after they had lost everything. Their homes, photographs, pictures, automobiles, savings. But Paul Morton was on the news, Bishop Morton was on the news and members of his church were falling in his arms crying and I remember like it was yesterday he, he said to them, it's gonna get better. He didn't have any proof. Look at somebody say, I ain't got no proof. All I got is his word, but somebody needs to hear that it's going to get better. I wish you'd meet me. I wish you'd meet me up here at this altar and just get some help tonight. I wish you'd meet me up here at this altar and just let God minister to you in that place. I wish I could get somebody to just come to the altar and maybe you don't need to be talked off the ledge, but somebody might be up here that needs you to talk them out. So why don't you come on up here tonight? As we sing just a little bit of this song, I feel like going on. Come on, say, I feel, I feel. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, minister to somebody tonight. I feel like going on. Come on, say, I feel. Squeeze that hand and said, don't life, let life steal your hope. No trials may come on every hand. Stretch that hand tonight and reach up and receive help from the Lord. I feel like going on. I feel. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I feel like going on.
want you to do something tonight. I want you to do something a little different. I want you to turn to the person standing next to you, and I want you to begin to pray for that person. You don't necessarily have to know what they're going through, but just pair off with somebody for a second and just tell them, I came to tell you, don't let life steal your hope. Say, I'm on assignment tonight to just be an encouragement to you. I, I'm here to talk you off the ledge. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what the burden is. I don't know what the situation is. But what I do know is that hope will save your life. I do know that it will get better. Not because it has to, but because God is faithful. Because God can be trusted with the details of our life. Come on and pray for somebody. Come on and minister to somebody. You are helping to save somebody's life. You're talking somebody off the ledge tonight. Come on, take a minute and just encourage your neighbor. Come on, pray for them. If you can't say anything but help, Lord. If you can't say anything but Lord, have mercy. If you can't say anything but God, give them strength. Take a minute now and minister to your neighbor. You never know what somebody is going through. You, you have no idea the trouble and the struggle that people bring in and out of the sanctuary. But thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Father, that you sent help tonight. You said you would hear us from your holy hill and that you would send support from Zion. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. And so God, tonight, we say thank you that we go from faith to faith and from strength to strength. We say thank you for the hand that we hold. We say thank you for intervention. We say thank you for divine intervention. And not just divine intervention, but we say thank you that you're using somebody to be an extension of your ministry, to be an extension of your hand. And now we ask that you lift the burden, that you lighten the load, that you strengthen our hands. Your word says that as our days are, so shall our strength be. So we say thank you that you're giving us strength for our days. You're giving us strength for the assignment. You're giving us strength for every obstacle, for every, every difficulty. We thank you for your grace that is sufficient and for your power that's perfected in our weakness. Now, God, hear our prayer. Hear the cry of our heart. Thank you for the hand that we hold. Thank you for my neighbor. Thank you that they still have hope and a future. I speak life to my neighbor now. I speak hope to my neighbor now. And I thank you for hope that's not seen. But hope that is not seen is not worth waiting on. So I give you praise. I give you praise that better days are ahead. That it's going to get better. In the name of Jesus. And we put our hands together now. And we bless the Lord. And we give you the glory. Hallelujah. Come on and bless him. Come on, open your mouth. Come on, give him glory. Look at somebody say, don't let life pop, steal your hope. Come on, tell somebody, don't let life steal your hope. Don't let it steal your hope. Don't let it steal your hope. Thank you, Jesus. Don't let it steal your hope. Don't let it steal your hope. Don't let it steal your hope. Thank you, Jesus. Don't let it steal your hope. Thank you, Jesus. I need some helpers here. I need some altar workers. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God is moving by his spirit. Moving. Don't let it steal your hope. I feel. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name. Bless your name. Bless your name. Bless your name, bless your name, bless your name, bless your name, bless your name. Don't let it steal your hope. It's going to get better. Tell somebody it's going to get better. Come on, tell somebody it's going to get better. It's going to get better. It's going to get better.
worship. Come on, I need some people that know how to worship. Come on, open your mouth and give God glory. Open your mouth Hallelujah. and bless the Lord in this place.